Potsdam Runaway Productions in Los Angeles. Yes. Well, look, everybody, simple math. Um, it's I have to do you, – first off, you can shoot – these guys – let me say something. Television and movie people, it is their job to make – Whatever location look like whatever other location. So if you can make some patch of land in the Mojave Desert look like a western town from 1861, believe you me, you can make downtown Toronto look like downtown Chicago. It's pretty fucking simple. You can... If you can go ahead in time a hundred years or go back in time a thousand years, believe you me, you can swap out the two warehouses you need to shoot in. So then it just becomes about math. Well, how much is it going to cost to get my ass and a handful of other people to New Mexico to shoot this shit and pick up a local crew versus shoot it in downtown L.A., which is insanely overregulated? Then the hypocritical... TV industry and movie industry does exactly what they fucking complain about all day, which is they hop on a plane, abandon wherever they live, and they shoot movies like when I was doing a show in Winnipeg. Sam Jackson was in the room next to me shooting a movie about a cop that took place in Detroit or Chicago or whatever it is. Sam Jackson's in Winnipeg because it saves a nickel. This is all they do. So what I'm saying is that if these people will do it, who won't do it? You know, like if, if the most thoughtful people on the planet will do it. I mean, if the people that are left leaning, never stop talking about paying your fair share, never stop talking about giving back, never stop talking about, well, look, fine, but pay a little more and do what's right for the community. These people fucking run to the airport to get the fuck out of this town to shoot somewhere in another country. If they will do it, who won't do it? Do you think the evil companies won't go to Texas and set up shop? Everybody will leave. Everyone already has. Everyone has and will do it. So listen, idiots, you're not giving them incentives to attract them. You're rolling back the regulations that sent them fleeing. You guys got greedy. Look, it's no fucking different than it's like California, Los Angeles. It used to be a good restaurant. The service was good. The prices were fair. You'd pay a little extra because it had a nice view. You could see the ocean. It was on PCH. So it's like, all right, that fish taco is eight bucks instead of six bucks, but you're staring at the Pacific Ocean. And then they started getting greedy. And they kept, well, oh, it used to be parking was free. Yeah, it's $4 now. And then it went to $8. Then it went to $12. And well, the fucking tacos went up to $15. But never increasing in quality. No, it's just the same tacos, same parking lot that everyone used to use. That's the whole thing. You got the same buildings, the same alleys, the same atmosphere that, you know, 99% of productions were shot here because this is where all the talent lives. This is where all the producers lives, where all the directors lives, where all the crew lives, where all the lighting houses and all the equipment rental places. They're all here, but they have to leave because you guys start charging too much for fucking tacos. And now you're doing this thing where you're like, oh, hey, fans of tacos. Guess who's coming back on the prices? Yeah. And by the way, we don't think you're doing it because you're good people. You're doing it because you're losing a ton of fucking money, you idiots. How else did you think this was going to work? And by the way, doesn't anyone study this? Like, <laughs> uh, of course it's going to work this way. And it's exactly what's been going on. And it's not like we haven't been aware of it for over a decade. I mean, Vera goes, it was too busy fucking reporters from Telemundo to ever get or doing rails with Charlie Sheen or whatever the fuck he was doing. But we should have seen this at the beginning. We talk about all the time. Breaking Bad is off the air now. It had five seasons in Mexico. It was supposed to be in Riverside, California. I drove Cranston to the airport. I don't think Cranston, who lives in the San Fernando Valley, particularly wanted to spend months on end in New Mexico or shuttling back and forth from New Mexico to Los Angeles, but he had to. You know, now there's entire local industries built up in New Mexico or in Vancouver or wherever, and it, now it's going to be harder to right. shut the barn door after the horses. Somewhere around two decades ago, when this all began, 
And somebody's remedy for it was, well, now we have to increase taxes to make up for this void. Somebody should have fucking hit him with a slipper and said, you're going the wrong direction. Don't increase taxes to fill the void. That'll be more fling. Lower them down and make make it hospitable for them. And then they'll stay around. And then we'll all share the 20% versus the 0% of 50% which you're trying to charge. It's, it's a simple equation. I, I don't know why there's not – shouldn't we have like – a business czar in like every big town. I mean, it's all we are is a business. I mean, you can call it a community. There's a group of firemen and a group of school teachers and a group of whatever, but it's really just one big business. And it's the business is made up of small businesses trying to sort of coexist around each other and a symbiotic relationship. Like, Hey, you have a cab. Good. I have a nightclub. I'm going to work a deal out with you where you come to my nightclub and whatever it is. That's, That'll be our little existence. And the city's job is to be sort of the band conductor, the state's job. It's like you, you help everything work, but don't overregulate everything. Till, I mean, till we're always at the bottom of everyone's list of – and again, I talked to my buddy Skip who does the show. We were standing – unfortunately, in South Central, but we're standing outside. It was, we were literally hot. Like we had to seek shade. It was one thirty in the afternoon and it was hot. And I said, can you just believe you came from a place that was completely snowed in? And yeah, that's why we charge what we charge for the tacos. But we got too greedy and people started fleeing. So now we'll reel it back and see what happens. You think it'll work? I mean, I know it'll work because... Hollywood, no matter what they what they talk about, and it's 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 overcompensation with all the heart and all the fucking giving back and all the joining hands and all this bullshit. One big fat business, all they do is they will leave or they will stay depending on what kind of deal you're giving them. And they don't really have a choice. They just have producers that are in charge of the bottom line. They they'd get fired if they stayed in places that were more expensive than going to Louisiana, New Mexico, or Vancouver. You've got it locked to HTLA Radio 1, New York. This program is intended for mature audiences only. If you have any homicidal or suicidal feelings, please consult a doctor before listening to this program. Uh, you know it is. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, it is that time again. You've got it tuned to HTLA Radio Uno. Oh, yeah, you do right here. HTLA Radio 1, New York, 3 p.m. Eastern. We are coffee and cigarettes for your Friday Frappuccino today. Getting ready to kick off the big weekend. Who's ready? I know I'm ready. Yeah. Well, you know, you know me, as always, I've got a great show lined up for you today. And uh, yeah, there's there's no bones about that. That's right. We got the one, the only Jenny McCartney, the the social media goddess in the booth, pushing all the buttons, making us go today. Yes, she is. And uh, well, hey, we got Louis Lawless, we got Tom Cruise, we got George Takei. So fasten your seatbelts, hold on to your butts, it's coming to you. Today on the big show, the big ticket barbecue prices are soaring in Texas, while officials claim no American was killed by ISIS. Mm. And the Kremlin says Putin does not have Asperger's. <laughs> also, young Republican congressman dies as the Detroit Walker gets a brand new car! Uh, all that and so much more to come on the show today. So, hey, come on in, grab a cup, have a seat, <laughs> light one up. Yeah, it's time for your coffee time.
Well, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it may be to you. If you are listening to my voice, you have got it locked to HTLA Radio 1 New York, where it is currently 307 Eastern in the big city. 24 degrees in Central Park right now and sunny, but uh, we're looking at, well, yeah, snow Sunday and Monday. (laughs) Uh, Go ahead, bring it. We can take it. You're not going to stop us, no siree. That's right. Well, let's see. What have I got rolling today? I got lots of stuff rolling today. But, of course, before we get to it, uh, I do have to say that today's show is... Powered by Procast. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Yes, we are indeed powered by Procast Global Incorporated here at HTLA and uh, happy for it. And, of course, we are live, HTLA Studio 2, Manhattan. One, the only, the one, the only, yes, I should say, Jenny McCartney in the booth, pushing the buttons, making this show go, and she's making social media go. My God. She's got, what, close to 4,500 friends now. This is this is day five of her being on Facebook at my request. <laughs> yeah, what have I done? I know, I know. Well, she's in the booth, pushing the buttons for us, making us go. She does have some, uh, well, I guess Russian lessons for you all here coming up shortly on the big program. Also, as usual, live via satellite is the one, the only, Louis Lawless from Mill Bay Studios in beautiful downtown Mill Bay, British Columbia, Canada. Louis, are you there, sir? I know how to spell my last name on the check, right? It's Louis Lawless. <laughs> Yes, I, I can, is, is his level okay? Yeah. Oh, can we cuss? Can I cuss as I always do on on the show? <laughs> <laughs> uh, you 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 give it your best shot, sir. I'll, I've got the button right here. About, it's about fucking time. Move on. Move on. <laughs> See, I knew you were going to do that. Also, from his sixty million dollar penthouse overlooking Columbus, not Commerce Circle, <laughs> here in the big city. This is the one, the only Mr. Tom Cruise. Thank you for joining us here today again, Tom. Sure, absolutely. Good to uh, good to see you here. I want to help people. Uh, yeah. It's not something that I just say. It's something that I'm, <laughs> I'm actively pursue, and and that's how I feel. I feel privileged, truly. Well, you know, uh, thank you, and 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 from all of us at HTLA, we we are uh, absolutely. Completely privileged to uh, to have you here uh, every day for the last couple of weeks. It's uh, it's been great. Thank you. Uh, absolutely. All right, and of course, going back to the other coast again, uh, all the way from his home in beautiful Los Angeles, California, the one, the only, Mister Sulu George Takei. <laughs> I think it's a treat to be here talking with you. Well, thank, <laughs> thank you, George. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> You're just a, a laughing kind of guy today. And um, I'm, I'm going to do it again because, uh, you know, it, it was such a hit yesterday with, with Tom. Uh, he, he absolutely loved uh, George's story uh, about Bobby. Um, but before we get to that... <laughs> Uh, let's, uh, let's get a little bit into, uh, you know, George here, G- give the, the folks at home who may not know you. I know that's hard to understand, but just give them a little, a little bio, a little. I'm George Takei. And, uh, when I'm walking down the street, people shout out, Hey, Sulu. So I'm no more as Sulu than as George Takei, which is what I really am. Yes, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Now, you did uh, the Star Trek series, of course. I, I know you were in the movies. Uh, I've done uh, Star Trek, uh, the uh, series, and uh, the uh, movie series up to the sixth one. Right, which is, of course, my favorite, personally. <laughs> well, no, it is. It, it just, you know, the uh, that, that it really rounded it out for you, I think. And, and, and Captain suits you, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, absolutely. Uh, so yeah, so we got a, a big show again today with all you fine dudes, and uh, we're we're glad to have you here. Wait a minute, I got lost. H T L A. Oh, H T L A. Hell is that? Um, <laughs> I, I'm not even going to say, Louis. It's it's okay. Just relax. Uh, go back on hold. <laughs> the music is fantastic. <laughs> oh, you got to hear it. 
I know. I've I've called in sick before to the studio. Wait a minute. No, I haven't. <laughs> no, I haven't. I've never, I've never had a sick day. Never happened. Not once. Um, no, no, that's right. Jeez, look at that. What is it? Five years on the air now, and never, never a sick day. Look at that. I'm I'm great, aren't I? It's about, it's about fucking time. Move on. Move you want to move on? <laughs> Come on. Let's go, man. All right, guys. Fine. Jeez, can't have a little fun around here. What the hell is going on? Well, <laughs> oh yes, thank you, George. Thank you. Uh, the, the big, the big, 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 big news today. It's a, it's a hell of a news day. I got to tell you, and we've got a lot to cover in the old coffee shop today. So, so stick with me on this one. This is going to be good. Are you ready? I'm ready. Big ticket brisket, baby. Yes, for for some strange reason, barbecue prices are soaring in Texas. And where in Texas, you might add? Well, of course, you'd have to ask me, because I am Christopher John Taylor, a.k.a. Crash Jesus. And uh, this, of course, is happening in Taylor, Texas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, signs of the withering drought has hit Texas the past few years. It could be seen on the wall menu at Louis Mueller Barbecue in this central Texas town. Yeah, it's taped over the price of brisket and beef, beef, beef ribs, beef, beef, beef. Updated prices. Get that? You, you, this this is staggering. Nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents a pound, and twenty dollars ninety nine cents a pound, respectively. I think it's. Uh, I think it's appalling. Well, well, it is. It is, and I, I know you're a, a big uh, meat eater, uh, Tom. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, you got to get something to get a little taller. <laughs> <laughs> I did not just say that. The mark of spiraling beef prices, brought on in part by the drought, it's incredibly concerning. Owner and third generation pitmaster Wayne Mueller said, "We're moving away from barbecue being the basement of culinary food chain into something altogether different." It's becoming five-star pricey. Yeah, figure that out. A confluence of drought leading to less beef cows in Texas and the soaring popularity of Texas barbecue has led to a historic beef shortage and subsequent price hikes that could drastically change the face of Texas-style barbecue. Once a staple of the working class and eaten at food trucks and picnic table dives, smoked brisket, the centerpiece of Texas barbecue, is slowly climbing into the pricey realm of white linen steakhouses and five-star restaurants. And the price hikes have no end in sight, apparently. Nick Pensis, owner of Stanley's Famous Pit Barbecue in Tyler, Texas, took to Facebook last year to warn customers that rising beef prices will be reflected in the price of their brisket, which has climbed from $15 a pound up to 19 and 20 in less than a year. He's relying on his breakfast menu, tacos, and other features, such as live music, to keep customers returning in the face of these escalating prices, but he doesn't know how much longer he can sell the pricey brisket, his eatery's biggest seller. It's reached a breaking point now, he said. There's not really a forecast for relief for this. The high prices have even made beef cut a hot commodity on the black market. San Antonio police recently issued an alert for brisket bandit. <laughs> who has made off with thousands of dollars worth of the meat from area restaurants. Brisket is so expensive right now, says Chris Conger, owner of the Smoke Shack, one of the pilfered eateries. A multi-year drought has hit Texas, and the largest beef-producing state in the nation began back in 2010. Scorched grass used by cattle to feed enforced many ranchers to sell large portions of their herds out of state and drive them to slaughter. A livestock economist, David Anderson, at the Texas A&M AgriLife Extension Service, says, Texas beef cow supply shrank from 5.1 million in 2010 down to an astonishing 3.1 million. I think it's, uh, I think it's appalling. Yeah, that's, that's nutty. There, there's a real problem there. A Texas beef cow population showed a slight increase earlier this year to 4.1, signaling that ranchers are beginning to rebuild their herds, but it'll be a while before those increases become stable slabs of beef, Anderson said. We're going to be looking at historically high prices for several years. At Louis Mueller, where customers start lining up at 11 a.m. to eat on 60-year-old picnic tables, the price of brisket once sold for less than $10 a pound. 
But then the price hike started and the menu got taped over with new costs. More than three times in this past year, Mueller said. Local customers have stopped coming in as often. He doesn't know how he'll do if this trajectory continues. And and man, that that is that's just nuts. That that that's not good for anybody, you know. Use power. That's why power is corrupt, and it is. We see it every day. We see it in every job. It's the same thing. Listen, we raise children. I, uh, you know. Yeah. I mean, how do you, you answer that? How do you answer that question? Well, uh, maybe by staying on point, uh, Tom. Sure, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> well, how would you feel? Uh, how do I feel about it? I think it's uh, pretty scary. I think maybe the federal government uh, should have looked into this, oh, I don't know, like two two years ago, maybe? <laughs> yeah. uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, th- this is uh, something that's surely, you know, when you see price spikes that are, are, are doubling, you know, that's, that's definitely your uh, little warning light there that uh, – we need to be taking a look at that. But, of course, they don't. No. Why, why would we do that? <laughs> well, it's sad, but that's the way it goes. And that's the top story on today's Copy and Cigarettes right there for you. We're going to go for our first two-minute commercial break. When we come back, yes, 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 you social media psychopaths, I will get to Jenny McCartney and her Russian for today. <laughs> uh, well, um, I'm a Shakespeare buff. Uh, I went to the Shakespeare Institute at Stratford upon Avon. I know, I know. We'll get to that when we get back here, uh, George. Just, just don't worry. Relax. <laughs> just breathe, my friend. I'll be back in two minutes, gang. You've got it locked to New York's best talk, HTLA Radio One. <laughs> What if there was a coffee that was sourced from some of the world's most renowned growing regions, abundant with rich, fertile soil? What if this coffee was picked at the perfect moment, then packed meticulously and shipped carefully to be roasted under the watchful eye of coffee masters? What if it was expertly blended ground and sealed, ensuring maximum flavor and freshness. Then brewed in small batches and always served fresh within 20 minutes, just the way you like it. Now what if this coffee just happened to be the coffee you already know and love? Tim Hortons. Always fresh. Always great tasting coffee. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. The hot new accessory, brows that wow. New from Maybelline New York, it's Brow Drama. Our first sculpting ball brush with tinted gel. Just sweep, then sculpt for bolder, sculpted brows. New Brow Drama. Get the look at Maybelline.com. Maybe it's Maybelline. fast-paced, digital everything life. There's nothing like experiencing the world's finest journalism in its original form. So sign up today for as little as $3.80 a week to receive the greatest newspaper in the world and all the incredible experiences that come with it. When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the best worst part was the shower. My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towels. Shower curtain defined that whole vacation for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better.
We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1. Oh, yeah. We are. It is. <laughs> Welcome back to the Coffee and Cigarettes Friday Frappuccino for this Friday, February 6, 2015. Good to have you all here. 24 degrees, still Central Park, sunny. But you know, that snow's a coming. Huh? <laughs> well, um,. No, no, George. No wells about it. It's coming. There's nothing we can do about it. It's game over, man. Game over. Uh, it's just life, and I love doing it. I love doing these kind of stories anyway. <laughs> well, that's good, Louie. I'm glad. I'm glad, and I'm glad you're here. And we are rolling with a good show for you today, of course. As always, it's coffee and cigarettes. Of, of course, it's it's stunningly awesome. Uh, absolutely. See? You know, when Tom Cruise agrees... It's it's stunningly awesome. Right? Sure, absolutely. <laughs> well, we're back, and if you uh, missed the uh, the first segment there in today's top story, of course, the uh, brisket shortage. We're we're all going to die. Uh, the zombie apocalypse is not coming. It's the cow zombie apocalypse. Yeah. Actually, I got to feel sorry for those ranchers in Texas. Really, to be totally and completely honest, I mean. Uh, you know, I got a lot of respect for those boys out there, and not just because they smoke Marlboros. <laughs> <laughs> Although they do, and I do, just like me. Actually, <clears throat> I got a, a hit on a new, uh, a new. Uh, well, I got to, I got the opportunity. I guess I'm going to say to to try a new pack of smokes here. Uh, they handed me Marlboro Blacks today. Yeah, I, I guess that's supposed to be the color of your lungs, or <laughs> something like that. I don't know, but. They handed me those today, and I, I was like, what? Are you are you serious? Is this a new sponsor or something? Like, what, what am I supposed to do with these? So, yeah, lo and behold, I open one up. Yeah, just like I'm going to do right now. I open one up, and I fire it up. And, man, I feel like going ranching me some cows. <laughs> you are a douchebag. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. But you know what? So what? Sue me. It, it, you know, it, if my biggest crime is smoking cigarettes still in this day and age of PCism, then then so be it, you know? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I don't feel it's ignorance breeds bigotry. That's right. And I feel awful bigoted on, Tom. Everybody, oh, I'm getting cancer on me. <laughs> you believe that? That that Gina, whatever her name is, with Adam Carolla. What? 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 I'm getting some cancer on me. Woman, go to school or look something up before you open your mouth. How about it? Uh, absolutely. Yeah, not kidding. That's, wow. That I didn't know they actually let retarded people on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> I just did not know that. And I finally figured out how to edit. Okay, scratch that. Never mind. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so George, uh, I know Tom wants to hear about it again today. Tell us quickly about Bobby. The boys around me were uh, saying things like, um, Sally is cute, or Monica is hot. Oh, yeah. And I thought Sally and Monica were nice, <laughs> but who really got me excited was Bobby. Mm -hmm. and, and, and please, because I know Tom is just waiting, waiting in the wings here for you to tell him what you loved about Bobby's body, huh? What, what particularly w was exciting was he had blonde uh, forearm hair, and mm -hmm. he was tan. That listen, that's when uh, what uh, caught my eye when I first saw him. Uh, <laughs> he had his t-shirt on, but you can see that he had great pectoral uh, t-shirts. And then to see it off, and his oh gorgeous body. Oh my! <laughs> actually, I've never done that. I've never actually done my George Takei impression here. I, sh I should do it, but. I'm getting bounced at from the booth. Yes, Jenny threw the glass there and gave me the sign. She wants to get to her uh, Russian language clips we did, uh, well, I guess, about two weeks ago now, back when she, uh, well, no, she started a couple of weeks before that. But, uh, yeah, everybody's going nuts on, on Facebook and Twitter for her, apparently. So uh, we'll, we'll go. Did Jenny, roll that clip. To say I had a good time in Russian, you would say, 
Я провел хорошо время. Mm. Now say it with me. Oh. Я, I, <laughs> провел, had, хорошо, a good, время, time. Я провел хорошо время. Great. Say it again with me. Я <laughs> провел хорошо время. Я yeah. провел <laughs> хорошо время. And that is how you say I had a great time in Russian. Oh, thank you, Jenny. I don't know why she does that. I'm never going to get that. <laughs> so there's, there's just no way. Uh, and she's got another one. Uh, what is it? Counting to 10? Is that okay? Yeah, that's the one she's going to do. Okay, here's Jenny counting to 10 in Russian for you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. To count to 10 in Russian, we would say один, два, три, четыре, пять, шесть, семь, восемь, девять, десять. Great, let's do it again. <laughs> один, два, три, четыре, пять, шесть, семь, восемь, девять, десять. And that is how you count to 10 in Russian. Well, it sure is. Thank you so much, Jenny, for that. Uh, truly appreciate it. And uh, now we're getting behind in time. You want to move on? Come on. Let's <laughs> go, man. It's about f***ing time. Move on. Move on. <laughs> okay, let's, let's move on. Fine. Yes, to the second of the top stories today. Mm. Kremlin spokesman says that Putin does not have Asperger's. <laughs> there we go. That's, that's what we wanted to know. Uh, that'll... Uh, yeah, that'll straighten everything out. Well, apparently a spokesman for Russian President Vladimir Putin said Friday that the longtime leader does not have Asperger's syndrome, which was theorized by analysts back in 2008 in a report for the Pentagon obtained by HTLA. That is, stupidity not worthy of comment, quote and end quote, says Dmitry Peskov. Yes, there we go, uh, Jenny. I can I can speak Russian too. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> Dmitry Peskov told Gazeta News website late Thursday. Uh, yes, the study conducted for the Office of Net Assessment, a Pentagon think tank, said that Putin had Asperger's syndrome, an autistic disorder which affects all of. His decisions, of course. <laughs> That's so convenient. Analysts at the Naval War College in Newport, Rhode Island, have studied Putin and other world leaders since back in 1996 as part of their Body Leads program. And no, George, not Bobby. <laughs> yeah. The 2008 study monitored Putin's movements through a discipline called movement pattern analysis and concluded that very early in life, perhaps even in utero, Putin suffered a huge hemispheric event to the left temporal lobe of, lobe of his prefrontal cortex. My God, I feel like a doctor. <laughs> Yes, we, if we ever do open a rock and roll station, guys, you can bet I am going to be the doctor. Dr. Fever, yeah, yeah. No? <laughs> <laughs> you are a douchebag. I know, I know. But what, what do you do when you live in a shoe, right? Anyway, uh, apparently he's, he's got brain damage. That that was the logical conclusion that the morons at intelligence came to. I don't know how you can come to this conclusion. Well, he's threatening war with the U.S. He he must be retarded. He just he must power, be. That's why power is corrupt, and it is. We see it every day. We see it in every job. It's the same thing. Well, yeah, but I guess by the same argument, they were probably saying in reports about North Korea that Kim Jong-un or Il or hoo hoo or whoever... <laughs> Whoever's in charge over there must be suffering some brain damage, too. So, uh, absolutely. Yeah, well, you'd think, right? I think it's, uh, hmm? I think it's appalling. I think it's appalling uh, that they're still burning synagogues in France. Right. I think it's appalling how certain Muslims are being treated. Oh. I think it's absolutely appalling when we talk about freedom of speech and human rights. I think it's appalling that they electric shock people. I think it's appalling that they drug children. I think it's appalling that they say that there are no <laughs> solutions for those things. I think it's appalling that people have to live a life of, of drug addiction. I think it's, uh, I think it's appalling. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Are you done? <laughs> uh, absolutely. Okay. All right. Good. Uh, thank you for that perspective, 
<clears throat> Tom. Um, well, how would you feel? Well, uh, to be totally honest with you, on matters of national security and foreign intelligence, I never, and I underscore the word never, claim to have an opinion on that because that is something, quite honestly, that we know nothing about. We just don't. I mean, you know, you stop and think about it. Oh, sure, we we see all these stories through the the news media all the time about you know CIA says this and the NS, NSA does that and you know um, your favorite secret service agent can be found on Twitter and, and Facebook. But <laughs> you know, I, I I don't buy it. I I really don't buy it. I, I think that uh, yeah, no, I, we don't know nothing. I'm I'm going to say that you being Catholic, you realize that you can have birth control. You realize that? <laughs> yes, I do. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, man. Well, hey, you know, what can you do when you live in the shoe? A Pentagon spokeswoman said Thursday that high-ranking officials uh, there had not seen the report, and White House spokesman Josh Ernest said he had no comment on the uh, USA Today report about Putin. However, Michael McFall, former U.S. ambassador to Russia, said on MSNBC yesterday the U.S. government studied Putin and other leaders often, although he did not mention specifics, of course, because as I said, we don't know Jack. <laughs> yeah, well, there it is. So uh, Absolutely. <laughs> yes, I know. I'm, you know, they, they don't just stick a moron in this seat and throw the mic in front of his face. Now, I actually know what I'm talking about. Bullshitters, never <laughs> keep your mouth shut, always hustle. Always looking for something to do and, and putting things together. That's that's a f American. Look how they took the country away from England. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, well, what? I don't know. That's what they do. They, you know, you've got ADD, ADHD, and you go, "What is the solution?" To that well, there isn't a solution. And now today, it's take drugs. They actually wanted to put me on drugs. That's what I want. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> he wants to. Of course. I, I mean, yeah. I, I know. Well, why wouldn't you? Oh God. Well, before we get to our next exciting, exciting story, my God, I, I can't tell you how excited I am with all the amazing stories uh, that are showering us here today on Coffee and Cigarettes. George, tell us about gay bar bars, please. Gay bars. As I um, yeah. uh, grew up, I made another discovery. There were places called gay bars. <laughs> You're stepping over a line. Right? You're stepping over a line. You know you are. I'm just telling you right now. Put your manners back in. <clears throat> All right. <clears throat> I will. Sorry. I just had to do it. It was fun, you know? Uh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it is. So, hey, the next up on the big uh, top news parade in today's exciting world of news, in Washington, Republican Alan Nunley, a Mississippi, a Mississippi Republican congressman, part of the historic 2010 GOP wave election that gave the party control of the House, has died today. He was 56 years old. Congressman Alan Nunley has gone home to be with Jesus. He was well-loved and will be greatly missed, said a statement from his family. Nunley, who was serving his third term, underwent brain surgery last June and had been in and out of hospitals and rehabilitation centers the past year. He was hospitalized again December 28th in Mississippi and was unable to take an oath of office for the 114th Congress on January 6th with other lawmakers. Nunley was sworn in a week later by U.S. District Judge Michael P. Mills at the North Mississippi Medical Center in Tupelo. Mississippi Governor Phil Bryant called Nunley the best man I have ever known. Alan Nunley has been like a brother to me and was one of my dearest friends and companions, Bryant said. I will miss him greatly. Deborah and I are praying for Tori and their children. A former Mississippi state senator, Nunley served on the powerful House Appropriations Committee. He was vice chairman of the panel's subcommittee on energy and water development and related agencies. In 2011, Nunley, a fiscal financial conservative, was one of three GOP freshmen given a coveted seat at the Appropriations Committee. Nunley, who unseated Democratic Rep Representative Travis Childers in 2010 to win his seat, was highly respected in the House. Former Mississippi Senator Trent Loft said recently, A member of the Conservative Republican Study Committee, Nunley represented a mostly rural 1st District of northern Mississippi. Before that, he served in the state Senate from 95 to 2011 and was chairman of the state Senate Appropriations Committee from 2008 to 2011. 
After first arriving in Congress, Nunley drew a decidedly unlucky number in the lottery for House Office Suites, number 84 out of 85. That's why I stay away from the casinos, he joked at the time, but he said he didn't care what his office was as long as the front door says member of Congress and that hefty, fat <laughs> check. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I had to throw that in there. I had to throw that in there. Nunley was known as an amiable congressman who often talked publicly about his faith. Yes, separation of church and state and all that. <laughs> it's like the uh, Pope uh, addressing Congress. You know, what the hell is all that about? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, I don't get it either. As chairman of the State Senate Public Health Committee, he led efforts in 2007 to revamp the state health department. He also was a leader in the tort reform efforts in the Mississippi legislature. And if you don't know what tort is, go back to law school, kiddies. <laughs> there you go. So... uh HTLA, I guess, would offer our condolences and best wishes to the family and uh, a fine salute to the great congressman there. And moving on, well, of course, uh, weeks ago, we were plagued at Coffee and Cigarettes with nothing but uh, ISIS news and Khorasan and all, <laughs> all that lovely stuff. Well, eh, back in the news again, but not so not so deadly. No. The Islamic State claimed today, without providing any video or photographic evidence, that a female American hostage was killed during an airstrike by Jordanian jets in Syria. See, I knew this was coming. Officials in Washington and Jordan are quick to say that they had not seen any evidence to support the claims. Well, of course not. You pressed the button. Why would you? You wouldn't. You're not going to see any evidence of what you did wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's. Uh, <sighs> I think it's appalling. Yeah, absolutely. Site Intelligence Group, a U.S.-based group that monitors terrorist activity online, said the claim was made in a tweet. Yes, the, the, those credible tweets <laughs> <laughs> from an ISIL-linked group. The tweet also carried a photo of the alleged bombing site. The failed Jordanian aircraft killed an American female hostage, said the message. No Mujid fighter was injured in the bombardment. And all the praise is due to Allah. Yes, of course, as it always is. Frickin' morons. The message identified the woman as 26-year-old American aid wo wo worker Kayla Jean Mueller of Prescott, Arizona. There was no independent confirmation that a hostage was killed. In a statement, Mueller's family called on the media to cautiously report on her background and work and limit speculation in her situation and consider the implications of her security before publishing. I guess that's going to leave Wolf Blitzer out of the line <laughs> uh, there because, yeah. National Security Council spokeswoman Bernadette Meehan said the White House is deeply concerned by the reports but has not seen any evidence to support the claims. The U.S. Central Command has also said it hasn't seen any evidence either. Now, on Sunday, President Obama told NBC's Today Show that the U.S. was, quote, deploying all the assets, end quote, to find her. Jordan's military has a high level of confidence that the hostage was not killed by a Jordanian airstrike. <laughs> well, of course, I would too. <laughs> uh, no, that was not us. Uh, we did not do that. No, we are very good in piloting and things. Yeah, uh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> right. A Jordanian government official told USA Today that the official who spoke on condition of anonymity because the official is not authorized to speak publicly on the issue did not elaborate on how the military drew that far-fetched conclusion. The official also said that militants had been deceptive in the past when they claimed Jordanian pilot Lieutenant Muath al kizbeh was still alive even though he had been killed nearly a month earlier. Mueller's identity had not been previously released by American officials or her family out of fear for her safety. She is the last known remaining American hostage that's held by the group. Last year, the Islamic State beheaded three Americans, journalist James Foley, whom we all at HTLA know very well here, and, and we're deeply saddened by that. And I'm going to go one further, not just saddened. We were angered and raged. I, I wanted to go and cut the, all their heads off, too, and I still might if I ever get a vacation. <laughs> Last year, the Islamic State beheaded those boys, James Foley, Stephen Saitoff, and aid worker Peter Kasig. Yeah, Mueller had been working in Turkey assisting Syrian refugees when she was taken captive in August 2013 by ISIL. The Syrian city of Aleppo 
while leaving a Spanish doctor without borders hospital, her family said. In a 2013 article in the Daily Courier, her hometown newspaper, the Northern Arizona University graduate said that she was drawn to help with the situation in Syria. For as long as I live, I will not let this suffering be normal, she said. It's important to stop and realize what we have and why we have it, and indeed how privileged we are, and from that place, start caring and get a lot done. So we certainly uh, hope that that turns out well for her. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It's about fucking time. Move on. Oh, Move on. Louis, you're you're so callous, my friend. You're 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 so callous. I I don't understand. Uh, we we're five steps away from winning the Academy Award. And you didn't. And we didn't. No. And well, maybe if you weren't so damned callous, you know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. What what are you gonna do when you live in a shoe? Well, ladies and gentlemen, it is time for us to take our second commercial break. And when we come back. We're going to talk about Detroit's walking man and his new car. Yeah? No? Any? Okay. <laughs> we'll be back in two minutes, gang. You've got it locked to New York's best talk, HTLA Radio 1. White Rum has a new captain. Introducing the all-new Captain Morgan White Rum. Five times distilled for a smoother taste. The hot new accessory, brows that wow. New from Maybelline New York, it's Brow Drama. Our first sculpting ball brush with tinted gel. Just sweep, then sculpt for bolder, sculpted brows. New Brow Drama. Get the look at Maybelline.com. Maybe it's Maybelline. Good morning. Welcome to Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where fresh always tastes better. What can I make you this morning? How about our new flatbread breakfast paninis? Made fresh, just for you, with your favorite breakfast ingredients on maple or multigrain flatbread, then grilled to hot, melted perfection. Just $2.99. Who couldn't warm up to that? Tim Horton's Cafe and Bake Shop, where quality really does meet value. fast-paced, digital everything life. There's nothing like experiencing the world's finest journalism in its original form. So sign up today for as little as $3.80 a week to receive the greatest newspaper in the world and all the incredible experiences that come with it. When we arrived at our hotel in New York, the porter was so incredibly careful, careless with our bags. And the room they gave us, it was beautiful. A broom closet. But the best part, worst part was the shower. My wife drying herself with the Egyptian cotton towel shower curtain defined that whole vacation for her. Don't just visit New York. Visit TripAdvisor New York. With millions of reviews, a visit to TripAdvisor makes any destination better. We're New York's best talk radio, HTLA Radio 1. Oh, that's right, Kissy. Kissy Springer, HTLA Radio 1, New York's favorite intern. Once again, welcome back to the show. Coffee and cigarettes for your Friday Frappuccino. This episode is, of course, brought to you by Tim Horton's New York City. Yes, the purveyors of fine coffee and baked goods. You uh, won't find anything but fresh at Tim Horton's. Make sure to visit those eight locations throughout the uh, big city here to serve your coffee and baked goods needs. Ah, it's been a heck of a show. <laughs> yes. Well, um, 
I'm a Shakespeare fellow. Uh, I went I, to the Shakespeare Institute. I know, George, but I'm doing my, my segue, my comeback. <laughs> you you got to relax, man. You are a douchebag. I know. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Bullshitters, never keep your mouth shut. Yeah. Always hustling, always looking for something to do and, and putting things together. That's, that's a f- American. Look mm-hmm. how they took the country away from England. Well, then, Louis, call me a effing American because, uh, man, I'm, I'm breaking a story right now. We just got word. Uh, at HTLA Studio 2 here in Manhattan, we will indeed be interviewing the one, the only, legendary Academy Award-winning actor extraordinaire, Michael Douglas, uh, coming up in the next few weeks here about his new film, Beyond the Beach. Yeah, there you go. So that's, uh, that's big news right there, just hot off the old email. And, uh, of course, that's being provided to us by Sunshine Sacks. Yes. You want to get them sunny and shiny, then kick them in the sack. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it's just something I do. But, yeah, that's pretty cool. Hey, a high-rolling corporate shark, Michael Douglas, and his impoverished young guy, Jeremy Irvine. Oh, all the girls are going to be loving Jeremy Irvine. Uh, play the most dangerous game during a hunting trip in the Mojave Desert. In this lean, mean, cat-and-mouse thriller. Stars Michael Douglas and Jeremy Irvine. Jeremy, in case you don't know, formerly in War Horse and The Railway Man. Films directed by John baptiste Leonetti, who's famous for Car Blanc. Written by Stephen Susco, based on the book Death Watch by Rob White. This film is produced by Michael Douglas and Robert Midas. Yeah, so there you go. Uh, Michael Douglas coming to the big program. Not this one, though. No, he's too good for you guys. (laughs) Absolutely. That's right, Tom, even you. (laughs) No, I won't expose him to you guys. You're you're, you're far too brash or, or, I don't know, what's what's the word? Um, Abrasive. No one's ever said that to me. (laughs) Well, I mean, that's just like I see it. That is absolutely uh, maybe from your perspective. Mm -hmm, Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And maybe it's that uh, love hate. I think it probably is actually. If you stop and think about it, George, um, I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna say that. Did Did you uh, ever with Michael Douglas? You know? I did not sleep with him. Okay, just wanted to clear that up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. Well, we're back on the big program. Coffee and cigarettes. Twenty six degrees right now. Central Park sunny. But don't get any ideas because uh, we're getting slammed with more snow Sunday and Monday, if indeed not Saturday. It's unclear right now, but uh, the weather folks are saying definitely Sunday and Monday, tons and tons and inches and inches of more snow. Yeah, can't... uh can't get enough of the snow, really. I just, I just, oh yeah, <laughs> I, I give up. I, I'm, I'm just gonna say I love it now. Maybe it'll go away if I. <laughs> Well, you never know, but we are back on the big program. And today, with uh, George Takei and, and Tom Cruise and Louis Lawless and Jenny McCartney in the booth pushing the buttons, making us go, uh, what's our next story up? Well, it's a story from yesterday on Coffee and Cigarettes, uh, which you may or may not have heard. We, we lost our feed to Spreaker, so any of you Spreaker listeners out there uh, listening to us, you, you only got about 38 minutes of the show yesterday, but... Uh, uh, yeah, I'm getting the okay sign through the glass now, so uh, we're still okay on on the speaker. So, uh, but we gave you the story about the man who walked 21 miles a day uh, in Detroit to to get to work. Well, <clears throat> there there was a young kid who did up a little GoFundMe campaign for him and was able to raise like thirty thousand dollars for him to get a, another car and whatnot. Well, now we got some some more good news, Dad, on that story. Sterling Heights, Michigan, every man's hard-working, hard-walking, community, commuting hero, finally got a new car today. Detroiter James Robertson, whose daily marathons of walking to a suburban factory job made him an overnight media celebrity. Yeah, kind of like old Jenny there. When are they getting you a car? <laughs> <laughs> it's coming. You watch. Registered total surprise as he walked into the suburban Ford dealership in Sterling Heights, expecting just to get some brochures. Said Blake Pollock, the U- UBS banker who befriended Robertson last year while passing him on the road, began giving him lifts in bad weather. Well, this week, Pollock was shepherded Robertson, Robertson through a media frenzy. Instead of brochures, Robertson had a sea of reporters waiting in bl- a bright red new car. And what car did he choose? 
Well, you can forget the glitz that car buffs oogle each year at Detroit's auto show. Robertson, true to his modest roots and humble nature, will drive the model that he repeatedly said he admired in terms of that surely delighted legions of marketers in Dearborn, the Ford Taurus, because, quote, it's simple on the outside and strong on the inside like me. He had told Pollock he had like red or a burgundy car waiting for him in an optional ruby red metallic was a 2015 Taurus loaded with options and topped with a moonroof. Manufacturers suggested retail price $35,215. I can't thank people enough. I can't wait to show my co-workers, Robertson said, as he was handed the keys and tried to start the car with them. No, you just push this button, said David Fincher, Jr., co-owner of the suburban collection chain of dealerships, including suburban Ford. With a crowd of TV cameras rolling, Robertson rode off shotgun with a dealership employee driving to, quote, demo the car for him because he hasn't been driving lately, okay? <laughs> Fisher said to Robertson's friend Pollock, who arranged the gift on an eight or arranged the gift on 18-inch aluminum wheels. I love it, Robertson said with a grin after shaking hands with Pollock. Robertson is ABC's Person of the Week this week. The 56-year-old factory worker will be featured Friday on World News Tonight, along with a college student who has raised hundreds of thousands of dollars on his behalf and the man who discovered his story. An ABC crew came to Detroit Thursday to interview Robertson because they don't keep crews in Detroit because it's too damn dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Pollock, 19-year-old Evan Leedy, the Wayne State University student I mentioned who set up the GoFundMe drive. Wow. Yesterday we reported they reached $30,000 in their goal. They've now raised 300000 plus in just that 24 hours. Uh, absolutely on Robertson's behalf after reading about this story in the free press. Wow, 300000 I wonder where, where that money's going to go now, huh? <laughs> <laughs> he, he's going to be cruising in a Lamborghini now. Uh, absolutely. Yeah, Tom, you got one of those. Why don't you go and, and, and drive him to work? Yeah, I want to help people. <laughs> it's not go. something that I just say. It's something that I'm, I'm actively pursue, and, and that's how I feel. I feel privileged, truly. Well, you should, sir. You should. Thank you. Sure, absolutely. Awesome. <laughs> but it's about fucking time. Move on. Move on. You want to move on? Come on. Let's go, man. All right. All right. Well, yeah. So there. See, that's good. Yeah. Why not? Well, the from the from the good old man getting his his car to the oldest survivor of Pearl Harbor's USS Arizona has passed away. Yes, Joe Langdell was working as a junior accountant in Boston when he got the idea that he should join the Navy and go to sea. That was back in 1940, and America edged closer every day to joining the war that raged in Europe. After proving his sea legs on the battleship New York, Langdell signed up. His college degree earned him a place in an officer's training program, and in March 1941, the newly commissioned as an ensign. He reported this for his first assignment, the USS Arizona, stationed at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. By the end of the year, the mighty Arizona lay shattered beneath the harbor, sunk by Japanese bombers on December 7th, that finally propelled the United States into World War II. Langdell survived the attack at Pearl Harbor, along with 334 other Arizona crewmen, and devoted much of his later years to preserving the memory of a day that changed history. Yeah, a day that they don't even teach in schools anymore. It's appalling, I'm telling you. I think it's... Uh I think it's appalling. I agree, Tom, 100%. He says, The lesson I've learned from that experience is that the 1,177 men entombed on the ship right now will never know the love of a wife or the joy of grandchildren, he said in 2006 when his son Ted interviewed him on a video at Pearl Harbor. We all have to remember that they did not die in vain, he said. Langdell finally died early Wednesday in a skilled nursing center at Yuba City, California. He was 100, the oldest living survivor of the Arizona. With his passing, just eight crewmen from the mighty battleship remain. Ted Langell said his father had been ill recent weeks, but had celebrated the holidays with his family members and still enjoyed visiting the nurses. <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, once your Navy, always the Navy, huh? He had celebrated his birthday only a few weeks ago. 
Josh Kopcho Langdell was born October 12, 1914, in a Wilton, New Hampshire, the oldest son of Luther Langdell and Ann Kopcho Langdell. Earlier that same year, at a Navy shipyard in Brooklyn, work began on the battleship Arizona. Langdell worked on the family dairy farm and was active in 4-H. He joined the Boy Scouts, earning his Eagle Badge and beginning an association that would continue years later when his own sons joined and became a Scoutmaster. Well, you, you got to feel for these guys. You, you really do. And it, it absolutely shocks me and appalls me and to no end that we don't even teach this in school anymore. We don't teach Vietnam anymore. It's, it's, it's appalling. I think it's... Uh... I think it's appalling. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm with you 100%. That's it, It's ridiculous. Well, <clears throat> anyhow, gang, that's the ending music. We are out of here for Friday. On behalf of HTLA Radio 1 New York and uh, all of us here, Jenny, Tom, Louie, and George, of course, <laughs> like to wish you guys all a happy, happy weekend. Get out there and, and do stuff and learn stuff and just be awesome. I'd like to thank HTLARadio1.com, as always, for the uh, opportunity here to be here with you every day on the Coffee and Cigarette Show. And uh, we will catch you, well, I guess next time is going to be the Monday Mocha. Yes, yeah, Monday at 3 p.m. Eastern. We'll be rolling here with the boys and girls. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing you as well. And I guess that's it. I am out of here. Thank you, Tim Hortons. Thank you, Pre Sonus, for the 2442 beautiful mixer we've got here in the studio. Everybody have a great weekend. We'll catch you next time. Hell is that?